Well, it's a very good morning from him, and of course, it's a very good morning from me, or good afternoon now, because it's just hit 12 o'clock noon. So, uh, welcome to my mortgage live stream, my mortgage insights, all things to do with mortgages this week. Hope you're well. I'm Paul Archer, and you know that. Everything's fine here. Middle of August, really quiet time. No real news, because it's the silly season, isn't it? So, we wanted to give you some updates and some things to help you in your mortgage business. Got a little extra for you, which I want to kick off with, but then we're going to have a look at um, kind of a new idea I've got on equity release. And I hope all the providers are listening to this idea. I know they are because they're ahead of the game. And then I want to pick up on consumer duty. Um, I will just take a quick look at vulnerable client thing, really, because that's an important aspect for all mortgage advisors. <laughs> so let's get cracking then, shall we, with my, my first topic. And my first topic really is just... Uh, a kind of um, an update for you on the mortgage product marketplace, really, because I, I've called this the um, the forgotten three. It's a bit like you know the hateful eight or the magnificent seven. I call it the forgotten three, because you know when um, when the sunshine comes out in this country in the UK, because at the moment of course it's pouring with rain still. There, you know? apparently the sunshine is going to come out later this month. Though they keep telling us, and when it does, of course. Everything changes. We we open up our wardrobe and we get all the summery things out, don't we? We get rid of all the coats and fleeces and we get all the shorts out and the T-shirts and all those lovely things that we love wearing when it's warm and sunny. Now, when in the mortgage world, this is now, of course, I'm not worried about what you wear in the summer. In the mortgage world, when interest rates go up, which, of course, they are and still are, and they will remain relatively at that stage for a number of years now. They, they may come down at the old half percent or something. But we're always talking about mortgage rates of uh, 5 6% for a long time. Yeah, a long, long time. So we've got to make sure that we, you know, we have the right products for our clients. But what it's done is because interest rates have gone up, it's, it's, it's revealed the forgotten three product types. And I want to share these with you, see what you think. Number one, in my opinion, is going to see the resurgence of the cap and collar mortgage. Do you remember the, the cap and collar mortgage? Well, obviously, we've got fixed rate mortgages. I know that. But the cap rate mortgage is where there is a ceiling to the interest rate over a period of time. And the old-fashioned collar would have a, a collar to the interest rate over a period of time. So, for example, over a five-year period or three-year period, you'd have a cap of, say, 7% and a collar of, say, 4%. And your interest rate would bounce around in between those two, a bit like a bouncy ball between a floor and a ceiling, isn't it? It would bounce around according to the variable rate between the two. It would never go above the cap. It would never go below the collar. Now, the great thing about that mortgage is that the cap, of course, helps the borrower because she knows that she's never going to go above that cap. So the cap might be sort of 6 6% or something, fairly bad, don't get me wrong, but 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 it won't go above that. But of course, the borrower can then benefit from rates coming down. The, the, the collar, of course, the collar stops it going stupidly low because the, uh, the, the lender, of course, will benefit from the collar. So the collar helps the borrower feel that, you know, over a few years, if interest rates do come down, I'll benefit. I can see cap and collar come back in. If you haven't, Mr. Mortgage Lending people, bring it back in because I think it's something you could, you could usually work out with your swap rates, etc. So that's number one. Number two is the old deferred interest mortgage. I mean, way back when I was uh, advising on mortgages in the early 90s, we had the single deferred interest mortgage. Horrible, really. But people didn't pay interest on three or four percent of their mortgage. And this unpaid interest got accrued to the outstanding debt and increased it. I can see something like that coming back. I don't know what it looks like yet, be it an equity share kind of arrangement with um Obviously, help to buy was was that, wasn't it? With the lenders taking equity share, possibly, could it be a, a SAM, a shared shared appreciation mortgage? Probably equity release. People have a look at that one as well. Shared ownership, which is kind of kind of the same concept. I can see shared ownership coming into into fashion again. Well, DIY shared ownership, we called it back in the day, where people could go and find a property and the housing association would buy half and they would buy half. It wasn't a housing association property. So I can see that happening with some government money helping the housing associations do that. So there's all ways really of bringing monthly payments down. That's the whole point about the deferred interest mortgage. And the third one, I think, for you is going to be the tracker. We've seen the tracker. It's come through quite nicely. But I think it's got a long term. It's going to be quite quite reasonable. The reason for the tracker is that they can afford to do base rate plus a little bit. 
you know, 0.1, 0.2, because they haven't given savers the same interest rate increase yet. They have on the one year bonds and stuff, but you know, the current accounts and the instant access account still don't have four or five percent yet. They still go like about two, you know. So the banks are making quite a margin. So they can afford to lend at bank base rate plus a little bit. So I can see that being quite popular as well. So there's my my top three. Um, answers on a postcard if you have any other ones you think are going to come through. Um, don't forget the offset mortgage, of course, with um, rates of uh, interest on savings accounts, you know, the longer term savings accounts being quite high now. People have to, have to pay tax on those now because interest rates are high. So offset against the mortgage would reduce their tax bill as well as reduce their monthly payments. We know about that one. Mortgage payment protection insurance might see a resurgence as well because MPP, I know it's a it's a bad word, so it's a swear word now, isn't it? But the whole point about this product is it it it, it links itself to the mortgage payment. So if the mortgage payment's going up, which they are, then you can have a general insurance product which covers the mortgage payment uh, for um, illness, short-term illness, and short-term redundancy. I think that could certainly come come back because because the cost is like averaged over everybody. There's no underwriting in that type of product. So I can see that one working. The other one is further advances. I can see seconds, second charges. Interest rates are rocketing in that, in that neck of the woods. And the charging structure is really under the microscope at the moment. So I can see that becoming less popular, but maybe more further advances on mortgages because further advance mortgages cause further advances at normal rates of interest, aren't they? So I can see them resurging. So again, interest rates going up, you see, and staying high reveal these products and schemes that we've long forgotten over the years, but they're all coming back. <laughs> what goes around comes around, as they say. <laughs> I hope that's been a nice update for you on that one. All right. Let's... um. Let's go on to another subject now, which I'm going to use the whiteboard for this one. And this is all about equity release, um, which which is in the news a lot at the moment, equity release. Let's head over to the whiteboard and we'll talk about this one because um, I've got some, some good ideas to share with you on this one. Now, over here, I've already done my title, as you can see, the equity release client dashboard, I call this one. Now, I invest my own um, pension pot. Well, I don't do it. I use a company called Vanguard and they use artificial intelligence and algorithms to do all the investing for me in various funds. But they give me an app on my phone. So what I have, um, just to sort of show you a picture of, of the app, I have a phone app. Obviously, it goes on computer as well. And on my phone app, it tells me what my, my contribution is and how much my fund is worth, uh, whether it's gone up or down over the last week or two. And it's pretty that simple. <laughs> So I could have a quick look. Oh, I've, it's gone up. Quite dangerous, actually, when you're investing in shares and, and funds and things. To, to, to look at your up and down over on a weekly basis is quite scary, actually. It is, it is 5, 10, 15-year horizon. So. But the point is, I am encouraged to pay more in. I can, if I wanted to, I could just just add some more to it just by pressing a button. I could do a lump sum. I could do a, I could increase my direct debit. I could reduce my direct debit if I wanted to just by pressing a button. I don't need to talk to a human for permission for that, you know, because a lot of people don't like doing that. They just like to press buttons these days. Now, I think equity release needs to have something similar. And what I'm foreseeing here is the problem we've got is interest rates. Now, I had an email through from my friends at uh, AdviceWise this morning um, showing me what the average um, interest rate is on equity release. And it hasn't budged. It's gone up a little bit. It's 6 7 7.5% according to what you want. But the problem with that, of course, is that 6 7% is fixed for the life. So at 7%, you know, you're looking at mortgages doubling in 10 years if you don't make any payments at all. And that's quite a lot. Quite a lot. Most people live long these days, so you can see mortgages doubling quite quickly and then doubling again, you know, quite scary. And that's a big issue. But the other one is that people can't can't sort of borrow so much now. The loan to values are coming right down because of the high interest rates. Lenders, of course, are so worried about people's mortgages getting bigger than the value of the property. Uh, they, 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 they sign a no negative equity guarantee after all so of course they're reducing the loan to values which is restricting what people can borrow which is not good so i can see a new type of equity release product coming in giving huge amounts of flexibility now people love flexibility um, all generations love flexibility people think it's the, the generation y and z they love flexibility but older baby boomers do love it so what i can see then for if, if you've got a mortgage um, a lifetime mortgage from a provider. 
they give you a dashboard. And this is what I'm sort of looking at really with my dashboard. So let's put a PC on here. Now it's a PC screen rather than a phone. But obviously this would transfer quite nicely onto a phone, wouldn't it? The first thing you'd have is a box which, which, which shows you the balance outstanding. So that tells you, um, you know, at a nutshell, what your outstanding balance is on your mortgage. And that's real time. That's daily, you know. Um, I also think you're going to have some kind of estimated value of your property in the next box. Now, this is pretty cool because you can link that to various databases. It's not a difficult thing to do to show what your property price has gone up to. You know, technology can do that. It's not difficult. So immediately you're able to see what, what the percentage of your outstanding mortgages is as opposed to your value. That's pretty cool, that. Then you might have um, one here called further borrowing available. I like this one. So what you've got here is a box there that tells you how much extra borrowing you could have at a press of a button. And I like that one too. Now, the other ones, you have one with your monthly payment. So what's your monthly direct debit paying each month? There you go. Now, remember, this is a lifetime mortgage, which doesn't require any payments. We know that. That's why these things are great. But if you wanted to set up a direct debit and pay £100 a month or £200 a month, so be it. And what's happening there, of course, is that monthly direct debit is, is obviously reducing the outstanding balance because interest isn't being compounded so much. And that monthly direct debit, by the way, can come from your bank account or from your children's bank account. <laughs> there you go. It doesn't have to come from yours. Because, you know, you're going to die eventually. You'll go to care home. You, you, you don't really care because, you know, the money's gone. There. But your children will inherit and they're the ones that care. And they might think, well, actually, if, if we paid granny's lifetime mortgage by a couple of hundred pounds a month, because our interest rate's gone down on our mortgage, then granny's outstanding balance is going down. So we're going to get more of this dosh. People think like that. They do. I don't get pet what people say. Oh, no, they love granny. But no, they think about their inheritance. So I love that one as well. You could also add to that. Um, lump sum um, payments. Here we go. Let's put that box in as well. Lump sum payments. Now, what's happening now is you've got a lovely little dashboard. And what the client can do, you see, is if, if for example, they've come into some money because, you know, baby boomers do inherit money. <laughs> they do. Uh, they've inherited some money. And they've inherited £5,000, for example. They might decide to put £5,000 into that lump sum box if they're allowed to, of course, under the you know the different rules, uh, monthly uh, lump sum payments of capital can be up to ten percent. You know you can do that; it's not a big deal. So they might put five thousand, press the button, and it might immediately change this. Yeah, you know, they haven't paid the money; they're just testing it, if you like. It might immediately change this and increase that. And they think, well, that's good; we'll do that. And then they might, for example, increase the direct debit. Just just put four hundred pound in, press the button, see what happens. Oh, look, the balance outstanding is going right down. Isn't that brilliant? And you could have, you know, projected balance outstandings if you wanted to, because you've got a fixed interest rate here. It's easy to project five, 10 years, isn't it? And, um, you know, the further borrowing goes up. They might decide to take some further borrowing, have a quick look at the balance outstanding. But in the last year, the property price has gone up by 5%. It's a really cool thing. I think uh, people will, will, will take to this. Some probably won't. I get that. But, you know, baby boomers as we call them, are very good with tech. People think that they're useless with tech. Okay, maybe other generations were, but people are good with tech nowadays. And phones are very intuitive. They're not difficult to use. But here's the, here's the best thing for you. I think this further borrowing idea is great because it encourages uh, what I, call, I used to call the checkbook. Do you remember, do you remember checkbooks? It encourages the checkbook routing. So you've got like a drawdown set up, you know, with the equity release company. So you've kind of got this checkbook where you can withdraw more money when you want to. And that's a really good thing to do, particularly if you just want to write a check out for your, your granddaughter's university fee. Just write the check out, post it off. And of course, the borrowing goes up, the capital balance outstanding goes up, estimated value goes up. It's all very convenient. But here's the best bit. I've left the best bit to last. Um, I'm going to put it in here. The advisor, the mortgage advisor or financial advisor, by the way, because these are all being looked at by wealth managers as well. The advisor has something to do with this, because what I would do is I would offer a two monthly or three monthly, say quarterly review. 
So um, if you set up a quarterly, which isn't a nice one, review, you could pop around for a cup of tea or do a video call with your client and uh, open up the dashboard and just talk about it, talk about what's happening and where you are and what you could do moving forward. And this, of course, allows you to have ongoing advice. You could charge for that. Financial advisors have ongoing advice fees. <laughs> Why can't mortgage advisors do too? Because you're giving good advice. You're helping people along the way. You may just want to do this um, complimentary because you'll get referrals from, from their friends. Remember, baby boomers have got all the time in the world to have all the friends in the world. They play bowls and they go tennis and cricket because they're retired. So they have lots and lots of friends in the same boat as them. So you'll get a ton of referrals by doing this as well. And I think if there is any um, product providers out there, look at this sort of stuff, you know. This is the way it should be going. And um, and I think this will solve, not solve the problem of high interest rates, never going to do that. But it gives people the flexibility they can see. They can start making monthly payments, direct debit jobbies, you know. And that could be interest, a monthly cut capital payments if they want to, whatever, within the re restrictions. And I think that's a great idea. So um, if any product providers want some further information about this one, I'll be happy to offer my time at a consultancy fee <laughs> so we can talk it through. No, you found that useful. Bye. <laughs> All righty. Okay. It's great, isn't it, when you can see how things are changing and what, what you should suggest, etc. I suppose, you know, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Okay. Let's get on to um, my 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 last topic with you. And um, th this topic's on consumer duty. Now, I know consumer duty started last week. I don't think it started, actually. I don't think it's ever going to end, is it? Why did we have a start date? You know, I think it's just to have all the manuals and processes in place. But I just want to remind you of some responsibilities we've got when it comes to vulnerable clients. And I've got some, a whiteboard over here, which I've started up with a topic here. So I'm going to operate from here and talk to you about this one. Obviously, I'm talking about consumer duty, and we know all about that. It's been done to death. You've probably been on millions of workshops and online webinars on that topic, and you know all about it. But I want to focus on vulnerable customers. Oh, I spelled that right. Vulnerable cu customers. I'm not sure about Go back a few years. Um, 1986, I was working in the Building Society game in Stoke Newington, Hackney in London. I'm a young guy. And um, in Hackney at the time, we had a enormously multicultural client base, which was just fabulous. And I, you know, it, it, the world was represented, which was fantastic. And a lot of our clients, English was a second language to them, which was just normal. And for a mortgage interview, I would always encourage somebody who didn't speak English in their first language to bring in somebody like a chaperone or somebody who could do a little bit of interpreting, somebody they could trust. Now, if you think about it, that was vulnerable client procedure circa 1986. <laughs> there you go. Shows my age a bit then. 1986, what a great year that was. And I didn't know it was called vulnerable client procedure. I just did that because I thought it was the right thing to do. And obviously, they could have somebody interpreting what I talked about, etc. Now, the FTA, of course, come along and they've defined vulnerable clients quite quite deliberately and i think it's a good definition um, my, my my interpretation is um, somebody's got a personal circumstance and because of that personal circumstance they're they're susceptible to harm if the financial advisor mortgage advisor doesn't care that's simply what it is so somebody's got a circumstance and i'm not going to go into what they are There's, it's all been documented before but somebody has a personal circumstance and um, they're therefore susceptible to harm if the financial advisor doesn't care about that customer and that's the vulnerable client definition i think that's a good one too and it uh, it opens us up to many things now the consumer duty has taken that now to another level particularly for mortgage advisors now first of all um, I'll put down the consumer duty because, um, well, that's the topic, isn't it? Consumer duty, of course. I call it the 12th man. You like that? The 12th principle, actually. I call it the 12th man. It's a film, isn't it? I think the 12th man. The 12th principle. They made it another principle. They've got 12 principles now, the FCA, and it's the 12th one. And we know what that is. It's all about uh, making sure people have the right outcomes. And that's great. And that should we should have done it anyway. But anyway, the consumer duty has extended the vulnerable client's situation here now the first thing is they require you brokers is you've got to have procedures in place you've got to have processes and procedures in place to handle vulnerable clients 
Now, they say procedures. Yeah, let's put it all in there, vulnerable clients. They say procedures and processes because you've got to follow those. You know, you have a process, you have to follow it. It's, it's obvious, really, isn't it? So anybody in your business follows the same procedures. And it's up to you what you do as a procedure. For me, it was getting a chaperone in for somebody who couldn't speak English. You know, you might want to have various <laughs> more than just that. But we've known that. That's been around for years. And Consumer Duty has made that um, part of the deal to give the customer the, the right outcome, the best possible outcome. You've got to be able to have a procedure in place to deal with vulnerable people and spot them, deal with them, handle them, that sort of thing. But here's the, here's the big one for you. Number two is you also have a duty of care to providers. Now, as a mortgage broker, you have a number of providers that you use. Obviously, lenders come to mind, insurance companies, anybody else that you use to uh, provide the products that you advise on. Now, you have a duty of care to these people under, under vulnerable clients and consumer duty. And um, I was talking to a broker who had an email from the Halifax, great, great bank. Halifax, part of the people I worked for back in 1986, I worked for the Leeds Permanent Building Society, who were gobbled up by the Halifax, so part of that, that crowd, really. A very uh, traditional, strict, and like that. But they sent an email to this broker, and they said to her, look, you know, what we want you to do is four things. <laughs> it wasn't what we'd like to, we demand <laughs> that you do four things. Otherwise, you can't do business with Halifax. That's pretty much how they put it. Number one is we want to see your policy. So whatever your vulnerable client policy, we want to see that and approve it. Hey, that's a bit, a bit heavy, that, isn't it? Number two, we want to uh, to get involved in training for all your staff. Uh, we want to make sure that you know the training is right. So you have a procedure, yeah, but what are you doing to train your people on this? We want to see what you're doing with that. We want to see how you're actually putting that policy in, into practice. And this is the Halifax asking, telling the broker they want this. So that's number two. Number three, we want you to share any vulnerabilities that you spot in clients that you submit to Halifax as a mortgage case. So if you have a vulnerable client and uh, you, you do a case for them, you, you submit a case to the Halifax, the Halifax want you to tell them at that point what the vulnerabilities are. So they can make a note of that on their database and they can then deal with that accordingly because they'll have a, a process with that one as well. And fourthly, they want you to tell your client to talk to the Halifax directly about their vulnerability so they can talk about what further help they, that person needs moving forward. So when they become a mortgage customer, do they want to have um, you know, leaflets sent in a different language or something like that? So, uh, okay, a couple of things come into mind. Number, there's four things there. First of all, they want to see your policy, see how you've trained the policy, make sure you, you do do it. Oh, pardon that one. Number, number three, they want to share the vulnerabilities of the client at the point of sale, and then they want you to get the client to speak to them directly about their vulnerabilities so they can then handle them better. I think it's great what Halifax has done there. Um, careful they don't take your client away. Um, be careful of that. Halifax will have them as a client. Of course they will. But they're your client, really. So you want to make sure that, you know, that comes across um, in the way that you handle the client. And I, th I think it's a good thing. I think it's a great, great, um, great policy. So you'll probably find other providers will be doing the same thing because they, they won't. They're daft, aren't they? So that's consumer duty, really. And it just makes you think about what we're about. Um, 1996, of course, I, I was in the building society trade. If you wind forward to 1991, I was um, self-employed at that point. I think I was working for the PRU from, from memory. And um, I know at the time, because I had a mortgage submitted to me, it was a referral from somebody, from, a, from an accountant, I think, or some, some professional. And there was a lady came to see me in my office, and she was desperate for a mortgage. She had three very small children. So I remember, because I had a box of um, toys I used to keep in the corner, and the kids used to play with the toys whilst you know, we did our mortgage interview. And this lady was shed to tears. She had an abusive ex-husband, and I don't know if, if the husband was ex at that point, but abusive relationship. And she was desperate to find, get a mortgage to buy this house that she'd seen in the town that I worked at, Nap Hill in Woking, Surrey. And um, she was in just desperate situation. She'd been turned down by loads of different lenders direct. And I was obviously a mortgage broker, so I could broke the market. And I found her a mortgage with the Birmingham Midshires. Remember that? Great, uh, great. They're part of Halifax, aren't they? Funny, yeah, it comes around. And um, 
I, I dealt with her in a different way that I would deal with people normally. I, I made sure she was looked after. I gave her extra care. We had extra meetings to talk it through. Uh, we had shorter meetings because her attention span wasn't as long because she was highly stressed, as you can imagine she was. And I followed it up as well with completion, make sure she's okay, et cetera, et cetera. I just kind of had a duty of care to do that. Now, I was remember at the time because my manager of the branch of the estate agency branch I worked at turned around to me one boy said um, he said um, how do you have the patience he said to me of those words how do you have the patience because I didn't earn any more money it was the same commissions but I just felt it was the right thing to do and I think that's what vulnerable client procedures is all about it's about doing the right thing it's about doing the right thing not doing things right think about that because you know with compliance we have procedures doing things right is doing the right thing if you've got that built into your dna as a person is it part of your culture part of your your makeup then i think you'll build trust of all customers that you meet as well so uh, that's vulnerable customers or clients and consumer duty hope that's been a good update for you <laughs> bye on that one <laughs> it's funny when you go back in time isn't it you think about when you were a mortgage advisor in the 90s obviously times change of course they're actually essentially it hasn't really obviously technology has changed dramatically we know that but the, the dealing with people people are still people they, they don't change <laughs> generations change but people are still people and it's all about handling people in the right way so let's have a quick um, wrap up before we see you next week as always make sure that uh, you take the opportunity to uh, snap there for a there's there's the logo there which uh, or the qr code that takes you to our database if you want to get onto our database by the way you can always email me but just go onto our website there's always a box there where you can put your uh, your details in we would love you to have you on our database we've got a lot, lot of things going on, a lot of updates got free stuff going on saturday mornings as well um other than that i wish you the very best week you could ever have because you know you, you want to have a really good week don't you and moving forward enjoy yourself hope the sun comes out for you You've got a bank holiday coming up very shortly as well which is lovely to look forward to other than that i uh, wish you all the very best and um i'll be here next monday Bye.